Well, tonight uh, we are going to part two of fireproofing your life. And two weeks ago, we did part one. And part one, we talked about what it means to be a citizen of heaven. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, sort of as a, just a brief summary before we start the second part. And our key scripture is Isaiah 43, 2. When you walk through the fire, now you notice it doesn't say if you walk through the fire. It says when you walk through. It didn't say roll over and die. It didn't say run from it. It didn't say, all the, it says walk through the fire. When you walk through, which is our plan, the fire. Now, when we see fire here, we think, well, is this like there's a fire, right, of revival? But this is more like the fire of tribulation and affliction. But the good news is, I believe they're going to come at the same time. I believe it's the fire of God, one way or the other. And I believe it will bring a great repentance and a great revival because it's going to bring a great awakening. And that's what we're seeking here. And I know that we're going through difficult times, but if you go through difficult times for a month, two months, three months, knowing that it's going to wake up hundreds or even thousands of people, would you do it? I mean, would you do that? I mean, to give an opportunity where people have learned the lies that they've understood for all this time and to find out their truly lies so that they can come seeking after the truth. Well, the Lord is preparing us with a truth for that moment. So, yes, the fire, I don't believe, is intended against us. I believe it's for us. And we're going to talk about walking through the fire. You will not be scorched, neither will the flame burn you. It's not intended for you. So, we're going to look in this lesson... Seek first his kingdom. And we're going to talk about how this works out, but I'm going to go back and probably do the first few minutes to talk about two weeks ago, because usually when I do a series, the second one usually takes a little time, because I want to get you acclimated to what we're talking about. So uh, on the video, you could probably skip the first 10 minutes if you, if you really figured out what the first one was about. Well, the term fireproof means able to withstand fire or great heat. And uh, now, can you see that we're in a fire? I mean, can you see that? You know what it says in, um, in Revelation, the Laodicean church, right? Was it, I think that's where he said, I advise you to buy gold refined by fire. Well, we got a fire. Good news. We got something that will refine this, and we're going to talk about that. Haggai 2, 6 and 7, For thus says the Lord of hosts, once more, in a little while, I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. Pretty well covers it. I will shake all of the nations. How many? All. all. You see, he's going to shake the nations. Now, why would he do this? Understand, he's coming back as king, right? So the nations are trying to rule themselves, and be, they have to be given a choice. A choice you can rule as part of his kingdom, or you can rule on your own. And that's the problem. Uh, just sort of a spoiler alert, we find out that in the end, they pick their own way. So we know the first time Jesus came, he came because mankind could not establish his own righteousness, right? So therefore, Jesus had to come and establish righteousness. But that's not what he's going to do the second time, right? Right? Because the second time, he's not coming back like Savior. He's coming back as king. So what do you think has to be proven before that happens? How about that mankind cannot rule, effectively rule, this earth? And therefore, how are we doing on that? Can you sort of see that? So this is an incredible opportunity to understand the kingdom, because remember, we're destined to rule and reign with him. And so how are you going to be equipped to rule and reign? You've got to go through kingdom school. Well, when he shows up, there's not going to be seven years to go through kingdom school. Guess what? You're in kingdom school right now. We're learning all about the lies of the enemy and the deceptions that are causing all of this, because at some point, we're going to have to rule and reign with him when he shows up. Because he's going to have a very short period of time to set up a government. 
and we're just going to have to be that government. So it's really an exciting time. He is shaking the nations. You can feel it. And they will come with the wealth of all the nations and fill this house with glory. See, I believe that that's going to happen now. I really do. Yes, I do believe when Christ returns, the revelation of Christ will come. But at that point, things get shut down and he saves us. But I have a feeling that before that, we're going to have to have not the revelation of Christ, but the revelation of the bride. Because I think he's coming for a victorious bride. So I believe there's a moment in here where we have an opportunity to overcome, to learn and rule at least for a short period until he then comes back. So I think we have an opportunity literally to do this. And when they come with the wealth of the nations, it's not just a bunch of money flows in, it's the people that show up. Now with them are gonna bring a lot because these people know they've been lied to eventually. They're waking up. And when they find out they've been lied to, they're gonna look for the truth. Now sadly enough, they might go into some of the local churches and not find what they're looking for. Because a lot of the local churches say, hey, we don't talk about government around here. So they say, well, what's this kingdom of God? I thought that was government. So you, you see the problem here. We've got to understand the kingdom. That's why the nations rage, because they know that there is a king that's destined to rule, and they want to rule themselves. So we are that enemy. And that's what clearly where we are right now. So, yes, he's shaking right now. This is happening. And I do believe that we can win this. I really do. Because I think he wants a victorious bride that he's going to come for. 1 Corinthians 3, 11 through 15. Now, we covered this, too, last uh, two weeks ago. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. What's he talking about there? He's talking about salvation right? So we think that salvation is the end point. But here he calls it the foundation. So there's a difference here. Now, I believe that's important to understand. Um, uh, Don Curtis teaches about the, uh, the men that came to work for the uh, vineyard owner. And he went out and he hired some and they worked eight hours and some worked six hours and four hours and some I think only worked one hour. And they went time to get paid, they all, they all got the same pay. Well, what's that all about? Well, what happened is, that's the one pay they get, salvation. Doesn't matter whether you're, say, 50 years or one year, you're going to get the same pay, salvation. That is, if, if you're working for the pay, if you're a hireling. You see, all those people were hirelings. <laughs> you're not a hireling. You're a bond slave. You inherit the kingdom. It's what you build on top of that salvation that matters. So it's not just about getting saved. It's about what happens now. Because that's what he's looking for. It doesn't end with salvation. The gospel of the kingdom starts there. And that's what he says. Now, if any man builds on this foundation with gold, silver, and precious stones, wood, hay, and straw, each man's work will become evident. Is it becoming evident? It's because the day will show it because it's to be revealed with fire. I told you the fire is not against us, it's for us. It's here to reveal what is silver, precious stones, and gold, and what is wood, hay, and stubble. Because the fire will test it. What will happen if it's wood, hay, and stubble? Poof, right? And a lot of people, they may have got a salvation, but they're out there with uh, sticks and wood and so on and building some mansion. What's going to happen when the fire comes? Boom, gone. And are we seeing that now? I hate to say it, but we're seeing that in some of the churches that didn't build with the precious truth. But they ended up building their own kingdoms out of wood and straw. Well, those are going to obviously become evident that it's going to be revealed with fire. And the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. That's what's going on right now. But see, this is a good thing. Because you can buy gold refined with fire because we got a fire. If any man's work which he has built on it remains, he'll receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he'll suffer lots, yet he himself will be saved as through the fire. So the salvation 
you're okay. You're going to get through. If you're saved, really saved, then you're there. Everything may be burned up, but your foundation's there. And Jesus sort of uh, referred to this in Revelation 1.14. When John saw him, he said his eyes were like a flame of fire, right? So that means when he looks on something, what's going to happen? Polish, 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 poof, polish, polish, poof. You know, you get the idea. Everything will become evident when he looks on it because it will be revealed with fire. So as we look at this, our goal is to fireproof our lives. We want the silver, the, the gold, the precious stones. We want to build with those things. But the testing is not a bad thing for us because it, it gets rid of the dross. It polishes us up. It's not a bad thing for us. Now, if you build with the wrong stuff, it's going to be a bad situation for you. So we're looking at how do you fireproof your life? How do you make it to where the fire isn't going to affect you? You can walk through it and not worry about it. Well, you do it by moving your treasures into the kingdom. Because the kingdom's not going to be shaken and it's solid. So whatever is God's is going to be fine. And so we got to learn how to do that. So we're starting out with move or build your life. Your thoughts, your words, your joy, all these things need to be for you in the kingdom. You know, when you, when you lose cabin pressure, the mask comes down, you put it on yourself first. But then, but is it really just good enough that it's you? No, you also have got to move family and friends into the kingdom Amen. to protect that situation. And you can even move your wealth into the kingdom. Yes, and we're going to talk about that. I think that's our next lesson. And I'll explain why on down. So in the last lesson, we talked about know that you're a citizen of heaven now. The churches, a lot of the churches tell you that when you die, you get eternal life and you go to heaven. That's not true, right? Because when you are born again, do you realize that the, at that point is when your eternal life starts? You don't have to die. That's what we get. So you can be a citizen of heaven if you're born again. And we talked about that. You don't have to wait until you die to get eternal life. You will have it now. So the, and we talked about John 3, 5, and 6. Jesus said, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he's born of the water and the spirit. And then he interprets that. Flesh gives birth to flesh and spirit gives birth to spirit. So he talked about if you're born a citizen of the United States, you get this passport. And on the passport, there's a picture of you. And it's like the, your height, your weight, your eye color, all that stuff. It's your body. So your body is now a member of the United States of America. So how do you get to be a member of the kingdom? You have to be born again into the kingdom, but this time by the spirit. So we know that whatever picture is on that passport, it's going to age better than the other one, right? <laughs> we don't know what it looks like, but whatever it is, it's, it's going to be pretty, we're going to be fine. So you actually have a dual citizenship. And that's the key to understanding that what kingdom you're a part of. Now, if we look at the kingdoms, we talked about the fact that there's the kingdom of God. Jesus talked about the kingdom of God. We talked about there's a city of God. That's the capital of the kingdom. The New Jerusalem is somewhere out there. We don't know where it is. But the whole kingdom of God encompasses all this. Jesus said it. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. That means that we're supposed to be giving the gospel of the kingdom to the governments. When it says all nations, that's what's getting shaken. Nations are governments. So go and make disciples of the governments and let them know that there is a kingdom. It says, teaching them to obey everything I commanded you. So what we have here is in the United States, we have a federal constitution. So we talked about the fact that Holly Springs says, I don't believe there is a Washington, D.C. So therefore, I'm going to make up my own laws and rules. And we're just going to own your children and we'll kill who we want. We'll do this. We'll do that. That kind of thing. Well, if there's a constitution federally, 
imagine that that was actually being, you know, taken care of and endorsed, that the feds show up into Holly Springs and there's going to be trouble because they didn't obey the rules of the entire kingdom of the United States. Well, what the United States may not realize is there's a bigger kingdom called the kingdom of God, and we're in it. And what he said very clearly is, look, I've given you my word. I've given you my constitution. It's called the Bible. Pay attention, because when I show up, I expect you to be operating under those guidelines. Yes, can we make our own rules? Sure, you can. But you better not violate the ones of the Constitution of the kingdom. So we've got to understand what's about to happen here. That we are citizens, we are federal citizens. We're not local citizens. Because now we're citizens of the kingdom. We need to operate under the kingdom guidelines. Which are bigger than the local guidelines. So when the local guidelines come in conflict with the federal guidelines, what do you think is going to win here? Can you see that God's rules will overrule that of this little earth sitting over here? And that's why we need to be able to operate under kingdom principles. Jesus showed that we could live under kingdom principles. He actually came down here as a citizen of heaven and manifested that you can operate under the rules and regulations of the kingdom of heaven. And that they trump and violate, unfortunately, the, what our government is doing now. They override them. So that's what he's talking about right here. And teaching them to obey what I have commanded you. I've given you the book. We also talked about know that your place in the kingdom is determined by your walk today. That when he shows up, he, it's not, it, you don't like turn in all your resumes of the things you've accomplished. That's not going to make it. God, he, he, a man doesn't pick his bride by looking at a resume. I don't know if you've noticed that or not. But that's sort of not the way the relationship's going to work. It's what you do right now that's going to make that difference of whether or not you're the bride. So the things we're going through right now are a tremendous opportunity because we may not ever see this. Once he shows up and the devil is bound and there's no more wars, we're not going to see this. We're not going to have, uh, you know, all these different political and race wars and gender wars. But right now we do, and it's an opportunity to, to choose and to prove to ourselves who he is. When you leave this earth, what is it that you want to know about God? Because this is a precious time, and you want to pay attention. We are in kingdom school. So that's where we are, and this is what we covered in the first lesson. So I did that just sort of as a catch-up and for anybody who's new. So now let's move into what we're talking about in this lesson. We're going to contrast the temporary world and the eternal kingdom to start with. Because you got to see that, yes, you have dual citizenship, but the fact is those things don't necessarily line up, wouldn't you say? Have you noticed sort of a divergence between the rules of the kingdom and the rules of the earth? So that's the problem. So we talked about also last week a little bit of this. We talked about the fact that there's an overlap here. Uh, as an engineer, I draw these little things called Venn diagrams to sort of show what this thing looks like. So now if this is a picture of a saved person. If you're not saved, you only got one circle. That's the world. But this is a saved person, so he's got two circles, and they overlap. Why do they overlap? Because you're here on the earth physically. Uh, and that's, uh, therefore, you're going to live on the earth. So you're in the earth, but you're not of the earth. But the principles that you operate in are important to understand. You can operate in the worldly principles. I'm calling that carnal or fleshly. You can identify with the world. You can operate in the overlap, which is what we'll call those who, you know, okay, well, I can use my passport for the, for the world, on the, maybe on the club on Friday, and then on Sunday I'll use my kingdom passport. You know, it's a dual citizenship, so you should be able to use your passport either place, 
But the problem is, of course, there's a difference between the two kingdoms. And, of course, holy, I'm talking about that you lie, you're literally living under kingdom principles. So that's this white part here. I also sort of label those cold, lukewarm, and hot. So you see the problem here, that if you're, you can still be saved and operating in the world, or you can sort of operate in the overlap, say, well, sometimes I'm in the world and sometimes I'm in the kingdom, or you can say, I'm going to operate totally on kingdom principles. And they do work down here because Jesus proved it. So that's, I'm calling that process moving from the world into the kingdom, I call it sanctification. And uh, I've done a lot of teaching on it, so we'll not go into that a whole lot tonight. But notice that the reward, this is Laodicea, and I think you know what happens to the lukewarm in Laodicea, right? You know, they were, it says basically they were on the inside, but they got vomited out, so they are now on the outside. Not sure what that means, but it's not good. But also to Laodicea, which is where we are, to him who overcomes, I give the right to sit with me on my throne. Now, who sits with the king on his throne? The queen. That's right. So you want to be the queen? Can you drink the cup? Just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Just as I overcame? That means he lived the perfect life, a kingdom life down here. But how'd that end? Are you ready? Can you drink the cup? That may be what it takes to be the bride. Are you willing? He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So, yes, there's an overlap here. And we've got to decide how to operate in the kingdom. Because if you're operating under the kingdom, you're fireproof. It doesn't matter because all your stuff is preserved by God. And if they kill you, it's like, okay. I mean, my life's in the kingdom. What am I going to lose? This, this body that's falling apart anyway? Hey, I get a new one. Glory. Not only that, I get a reward. Particularly if you kill me for the sake of Christ. And that's what we're going to talk about. If we understood the kingdom and the picture we would be fireproof, we would be fearless. And it's really interesting, when this whole thing started probably three years ago and it got crazy with the uh, disease and the, you know, the shots and all that stuff, did you notice the fear that came over like the body of Christ and people? You know, it's, it's interesting because it used to be that the world would see the, the, the crazy Christians standing on the street corner and say, the world is ending, repent, the world is ending. And uh, they would, you know, the world would walk by and laugh at us saying, those idiots. Now, what do I see? The world is out there on the corner saying, the world is ending. And the Christians are saying, hey, yeah, you want, we knew that. So <laughs> let me tell you how to fix this. See, we were in fear at that point. Have you noticed that we're not in fear anymore? Have you noticed that? Have you noticed the fear just going away? Isn't that amazing? They're getting more fearful and we're getting less fearful. That means we're winning. That means that something good is happening here. That once we understand, that means we're becoming fireproof. We're looking at it and we're understanding now the kingdom, the true government that's going to rule and reign over this earth and over all creation. And we're supposed to rule with him. So we're being trained right now. It's exciting time to be alive. You don't want to miss this. Pay attention. So contrasting the temporary world and the eternal kingdom. Okay. Matthew 11, 11. For all those people who see 11, 11 a lot. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Okay, so John the Baptist is a model of the greatest of the born of woman, right? So we talked about that. That's what the one circle is born of woman. What was the other circle? Born of the Spirit. So of the people born of woman, John the Baptist is the greater. That means anybody that's not saved is, is less than John the Baptist. I don't care if he's the President of the United States or the Pope or anybody else. 
It doesn't matter because if they're not saved, they, that's their circle. But it says whoever's least in the kingdom is greater than that. The very least of a person living in the kingdom, the least person in the kingdom is greater than anyone on the world. See, you, you, you serve a different kingdom, and that kingdom is so much greater than the world, the earthly kingdom, that everybody that's just stuck in the earthly kingdom, you are greater than any one of them at any position in this government or in this world. And that's what he said. There, there's a difference. While we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. You see, the things that are seen is all this mess that we see, right? Turn on the TV. You want to see what's seen? And what we'll see, right? It's, you know, it's all the, the, the lies, the destruction, the evil, the all. You see that, plenty of that. But look at the things which are not seen. Now, it doesn't mean they're invisible. It just means you haven't seen them. I mean, that's why I said, if they say, you know, Paris, France, it's invisible. Well, how do you know? Well, I don't know. I've never seen it. So they're just not seen. But you know what? These things can be seen. Not seen by earthly eyes. We're going to talk about that. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And let's look at that a little bit. So the differences in your citizenship. If you're in the world, you just get a physical body now. You have physical pleasures now. You have a temporary life. And you have temporary treasures, right? Because it really doesn't matter how much money that you make or whatever. What's going to happen when you die? The kids are going to fight over it, right? I mean, isn't that basically the best you're going to get? You don't take that with you. So when you're looking at the world, you're looking at your physical circle. However, in the kingdom of heaven, the unseen, you get a spiritual body now because you're born of the spirit. And you actually get a physical one later, which is going to be really interesting because people think, you know, all the gender confusions and all the things that are going on. Well, guess what? When you die and you get resurrected, you get a new body. Do you think it looks like your old one? You think that if you lost a leg or something down here that your new glorified body is going to be missing a leg? I don't think so. No. It, no, it's going to be full healing. So there's going to be restoration. Because remember, sin dwells in the flesh. And the, and the flesh is going to go away. So now we get this new body. So what, it doesn't matter whether you've got gender confusion, whether you're in uh, your, you know, the, uh, I guess, was it 2S, LGBTQ, whatever, plus. It doesn't matter. Those things are going to be just once you get in a kingdom body, boom, gone. Because this is the design that God has for us. Now, I do believe that we'll still be male and female, man and woman, because he says, I created them man and woman. But we know there's no marriage in heaven, so we're not going to have to worry about same-sex marriage. That's not going to be an issue. So a lot of these things we're dealing with down here that we think are the end of the world are not as significant as you think. When you're in the kingdom, a lot of those things become less important. So we shouldn't be focusing all of those things. I believe a lot of those things do trans, I believe that there are men and women, and there's probably some version of race up there, I would think, because God made us all different, and there's distinctions, but we're not going to have the mess that we got down here now. So we don't necessarily even have to solve all those things. If you see these people coming in with their gender confusions or the different things that are going on, and you say, well, they're homosexual, they're not going to make it into heaven. Oh, really? What does it take to build a foundation? Salvation. Can, can someone that's homosexual be saved? Absolutely. So, but once you get a new body and, and, and all the new stuff, things will be very different. So I'm looking. So what's really important here, guys? Do you understand what's important is the kingdom. It's important the, your relationship with Jesus Christ. All that other stuff is not going to matter. You know, we're trying to join up with all these things, political or, you know, race or genders and all that stuff. And we're looking and saying, wait a minute, the real joining is with Christ. All that other stuff is going to go away anyway. 
So I'm not as worried about that as a lot of people because I just know that we all have different perversions. We were all, he said, well, I was born this way. Well, yeah, everybody's born in sin. That doesn't make it right. I mean, I was born in certain ways that I'm thinking probably, hopefully, my glorified body doesn't have that problem. So we, we just got to look at this thing differently when we're in the kingdom. So we, the physical pleasures now, we can have spiritual joy. Even though it doesn't matter what's going on down here, yeah, we can, all our physical pleasures can be taken away. And do you know you can still have joy in the kingdom? Your life is only temporary down here, but there it's eternal. Temporary treasures down here, but you can have eternal treasures in heaven. And yes, you do not get a statement from the kingdom every month like your swab account. And it tells you you got that number, you know. The big number, you're rich. The, poor, the small number, you're poor. Well, the kingdom doesn't send you a statement. If it did, it'd be really interesting to see when it goes up and when it doesn't. <laughs> so... There's a difference, but we can live in the kingdom now. That's my point. If you are born again. Also, you have a physical job and a spiritual calling. So which is more important? One's eternal and one's local. You got to look at this and say, wait a minute, I got to make decisions here. What about your physical family and your spiritual family? Now, if you've done a really great job in your family, you may have a spiritual family. I mean, your kids, everything, that's great. But you know, Jesus said, who's my mother? Who's my brother? But the one who does the will of God. So who's your spiritual family? Your kingdom builds your spiritual family. And if it happens to be your physical family, glory. But if it's not, there's a difference. Are you going to follow the world or are you going to follow God? So that's where we are. To be fireproof, we've got to think kingdom. Now, I look at this situation and say, well, wait a minute. The problem is with the kingdom of heaven is it's unseen, right? The other one is seen. Just, you know, turn on the TV, talk to anybody, look around. It's all everywhere. But the other is unseen. So how do you navigate an, in an unseen kingdom? Well, Paul mentioned that, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. So we walk by faith and not by sight. So I think there's some confusion about walking by faith. I think we seem to think walking by faith means, well, okay, I'm just going to go for it. I'm not worried about what's going to happen because I'm living by faith. Well, if, let's say a blind man comes in and he comes to the door. He's, I need to use a restroom. Is there a restroom around here? Yeah, there's one in the back. So he says, so he's, he's a, a man of faith, so he's just going to open the door and walk toward what he thinks is the back of the building, right? Is that going to work? What's going to happen? How about he runs into the furniture, right? So that's not faith. What that is is presumption. Faith is knowing where the spiritual furniture is or being guided by a hand that tells you where it is. It doesn't mean that you don't understand what's going on. It means that you see through the eyes of faith and that you know where the spiritual furniture is and don't run into it or you have a guide that's sitting there telling you, okay, go this way and go this way. So it's not that you're ignorant and therefore I live by faith. Faith is knowing the spiritual realm and how to be guided through it. Trusting, like this guy, the blind skier, Got one contact right there, the hand. And the guy's screaming down a mountain. Okay, we're going this way, this way, this way, this way. And he's blind. That, that's, that's the way you operate in the spiritual realm. You just got to have that. You want to have that hand and listen, hear that voice. But if you do, go for it. Point him down. But don't do it without that. That's just suicide and stupid. That's not living by faith. That's just stupid. Yes. In the world, you're led by what you see. But in the kingdom, you're led by, by faith. So that's why it's important to know people who operate in faith and to have a, uh, a good relationship with Jesus Christ. Otherwise, you'll just run into the furniture. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. 
Let's talk about that too, because now that you've got, you're in the overlap, how do you handle the overlap? How do you handle the priorities of the things of the world versus the things of the kingdom? Well, I think he covered all this, by the way. He said, seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So what's he talking about? Let's look at the scripture. That's where we always go to understand. I'm going to actually start not back in 633, but I'm going back to 67. Now, I don't want you to know what he's talking about here, but what he's talking about is what we call the Lord's Prayer. The thing that virtually every Christian knows, right? But do they understand it? Let's take a look. And when you pray, is that if? Okay, here's how you get, here's how you know where the spiritual furniture is. When you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans. For they think they're going to be heard by their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask. So what he's talking about here is idolatry. Okay, the pagans, the pagans were worshiping these other gods. Now, why did they have all these other gods? What do you think they did with those gods? When they went in to talk to the god, what do you think he, they say? They say, um, gee, gee uh, most holy idol, um, what do you want to do today? Do you think that's what he says? Or do you think they come in asking for blessings? You know, give me a good crop. Bless me, bless me, bless me. Isn't that why they create these idols? To look for some supernatural blessing, all focused on themselves or what they're concerned about? Don't you think that's the way it works? That's what he's talking about. That's the way the pagans do it. They are concerned about themselves and they're babbling on with many words. Now, if we understood this right here, we could probably eliminate what? Half our prayer meetings? I hate to say it, but you know, where you come in with the list of all the things that are wrong? Because he didn't say, he says, don't be like that. Then ha this is how you should pray. So I'm sure we all got this, right? Because, I mean, everybody knows this prayer, so they understand the concept, I'm sure. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be your name, not mine, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So isn't this exactly what we've been talking about? Living in the kingdom. Now let's go down to 631 through 33. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. Does that sound familiar? Does that sound familiar to you? Pagans, Father knows that you need, the pagans, the Father, those are the same thing. He's talking about understanding in the spiritual realm. That's what prayer is. It's connecting and finding out where all the furniture is and what's going on in the spiritual realm. But there's a difference here. A difference in the, than being a pagan prayer and being a kingdom prayer. And then he says... Check this out. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. And what does he say? Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and these will be given unto you as well. So can you see the parallel here? Can you see they're literally the same? The difference is, up here it says your kingdom, and here it's called seek ye first his kingdom, because here you're talking to the Father, here you're just talking about him. Same, same person you're addressing, on earth as it is in heaven, it says, your kingdom come, your will be done. Okay, here it says his righteousness. So does that mean that his righteousness and his will are the same thing? Yeah, pretty much, doesn't it? It's really that simple. You want to say, what is your will, Father? That's, that's by definition righteousness. Righteousness isn't all the things that you don't do that are wrong. Righteousness is simply listening to God and doing what he says. That's what he says right here. Your will, your righteousness. It's that simple. So here it's talking about the same thing. Do we understand that when we pray? That he's saying, I want you to move into the kingdom. Don't bring all your needs. Come and seek the kingdom. Seek ye first the kingdom. That means... If you're, if you're starving to death, 
okay, you're down to the whatever the last, and you're laying there in the gutter, and you're starving, what do you pray for? Do you pray for the kingdom of God, or do you pray for a cheeseburger? Do you understand what he's saying is you pray for the kingdom of God? Why? Because that's what's going to give you all of the other stuff. That's what he's promising. These are red letters, folks. This is, this is the way the kingdom works. This is like the laws of physics in the kingdom. So you're looking at it and it's saying, what we want to do is pray your will, Father, because that's where we get the, the food, the, the, whole, the whole thing. And we don't understand that. And yet he gives us the prayer that does exactly that. And we, we'll throw that in somewhere. But I think we, then we end up asking him for all the stuff and we don't really pay attention. So I think we need to understand this. So let's look at this in another way. Uh, a lot of you people in school have heard of Maslow. Somewhere in your schooling, they talked about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? It's the way the world works, right? That it says you start with your physiological needs and you work your way up. You satisfy each one. You start out by, hey, I've got to have food and water. And then you say safety needs. Well, I better protect my food and water because anyone aren't going to have any, so I need safety. And then you need belongingness and love. I need someone who loves me. <laughs> then you need having esteem needs. I need someone who's going to respect me. And then you have the need of understanding. I want to be wise and brilliant. And then you have self-actualization. Wow, I'm really all that. And transcendence. Ah, now I'm spiritual, I'm holy. So you work your way up from the bottom, right? Well, if you look at this Maslow's hierarchy of needs, I sort of split it into three categories. One, your personal, your needs, your social needs, aesthetic, esteem, all that stuff, and then up to your spiritual needs. So you work first is your physical needs and you work your way up. Uh, is that the way it works in the kingdom? Well, by the way, let's continue on in Matthew 6 and we'll see. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Or who you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? He continues. And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that's how much God closes the grass of the field and here today, tomorrow, and throws it into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? In other words, you're walking not by faith, but by sight. So can you see that what we're talking about is the personal needs and your social needs? He lists them. So if you look at this again, he's talking about that. What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. So look at the two. They're the same. You see that what shall we eat? Personal needs. What you should wear? Social needs. Because, you know, I got to look good doing it. And the kingdom of God, your spiritual needs. So what's the difference? The difference is the order. It's absolutely backwards. He took Maslow's hierarchy of needs and flipped it upside down. Now, can we do that? See, we need to understand that's how you move your life from the world to the kingdom. You've got to realize that he is the one who can supply all of those things. And you've got to believe that and move your life into the kingdom and trust him. Does it work? Jesus proved it. It better work. If it doesn't, we're serving the wrong kingdom or the wrong king. But if it works... My God, this is what we're here to learn. And we're getting a great opportunity because all the other side of Maslow stuff is burning up. You know, uh, we took our, our management team, our ministry team, excuse me, down to uh, the, the survival store for uh, training on how to survive, you know. So we, they brought in a special forces guy, you know, and we're all sitting around and he's talking about, okay, now, you know, when things go down, because, you know, we're a church, a community, and a community is supposed to take care of their own. So we're trying to figure out, okay, we read the revelation. We know some difficult times are coming. So what are we going to do to prepare for them? So we went down there and says, what do we need to do? So he says, the first thing he does, he comes up and says, 
what do you think is the most important thing for survival? And of course, food, air, water, you know, all this stuff. And he says, what is it? He says, no, it's none of those. So what is it? He said, community. This is a special forces guy. Even he knows the truth. That's more important because if you think you have these things, if you can't bring people together and, and operate as a body, you're not going to make it. And that's what he's trying to tell us. And his, that's what a church is for. And yet the churches, I said, how many churches come down here? None. Have you worked with any churches to prepare? No. And I'm looking at it and saying, duh. So you see the situation here. We need to understand this. Seek ye first the kingdom. He understands it. Why don't we? The problem is with a lot of survivalists, I admit, a lot of them are loners. Because they believe by keeping everybody out and they can narrow things down. And there's probably a point for that. But if you're trying to get some, a lot of people together and survive, you're probably better off figuring out how do I join together and get through this. Well, that's what it's going to take because we're dealing with an enemy that is well connected across a large spectrum. They got everything. They got the government. They got the medical system. They got the school systems. They got the media. They got everything all connected together. And we're out here in this little bitty square in these four walls in the building trying to hide. Wrong. It's time to connect. It's time to build a kingdom because he will win. Oh, by the way, if you want a little test for this, it's really simple. We all meet people, and the first thing they want to talk about is the kingdom, right? I mean, I'm going to let you guys know just the type of conversations we're going to hold. And almost every one of you guys, it's the first thing you're going to talk about is, what is God saying? What's going on? That's the kingdom, right? You know, like if, if Alan ever gives you a call, he's not there to talk about just the, you know, what the weather is today. <laughs> he's got a word from God. And, you, I mean, you can know the people... There's, this is the people who are operating in the kingdom. But unfortunately, you probably also know some people, the first thing they want to talk about is themselves, right? Because that's the measure. If you're thinking, which do you go to first? What you think, what people think, or what God thinks? Which do you go first when you're talking? Do you talk about yourself? Do you talk about other people? Or do you talk about the kingdom? That'll sort of tell you where you are if you get that. See, we're changing. Isn't it neat? Exciting. So, we've talked about moving your life. And what we're going to be talking about next is I'm going to actually skip your family and your friends, even though that's the next important thing. The reason is I want to get into some of the principles on the wealth. Because if you understand those principles, then we'll go back and talk about how they work for people. So it's, 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 it's just a little easier to talk about that than it is to go into the emotions of relationships like family and everything because people just get emotional about it. So let's get the principles down with something a little, you know, uh, less volatile. Your money. <laughs> of course, no problem. We can figure this one out. So, Lord, we thank you. We thank you, Father, that we want to be fireproof in this time. Bring the fire on, Lord. It'll only polish us up. And we're looking forward to it. And if we built with wood, hay, and stubble, hey, just burn it up, Lord. We want to know it now. Because, Lord, we're seeking you and your kingdom first. And we desire, Father, to know your will and your ways. So I ask you to reveal it to each one here tonight. And I bless them with your truth, your wisdom. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.